You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. How's that, Mr. Raiden? It should do nicely. The volume could be a bit higher, though. Higher? You gotta be careful not to break those speakers. I thought you installed subwoofers, state-of-the-art, as I requested. Oh, we did. For later. Will you hear them? When the explosion hits here, you'll really feel it. Good. Good. I don't know where you got your sound effects, but you'd swear a bomb was going off outside. I mean, a big bomb. That's precisely what I want. I got the other TV hooked up, sir, at the end of the hall, like you said. Let me see. Here's the remote control. You got your on, and then you got your off and your volume. Uh, did you load the videotape? Sure did. As soon as the monitors go on, it starts rolling. Why don't you show me? All right, Mr. Raiden. Let's give it a test run. Look at that, would you? There's the street outside. Only now it looks like the beginning of World War III. Yes. <laughs> yes. This calls for something of a celebration. If you don't mind me asking, where'd you get the footage? Some special effects guys out in Hollywood? Oh, you might say I have my contacts. Given adequate funding, anything is possible. Yeah, some setup you got here. All part of the show, huh? This is not a show. It may be, let us say, an illusion, but this room is not an illusion. It happens to be the best designed bomb shelter on the face of the earth. But tonight it's for gags, right? Something of the sort. A practical joke, and I trust a most effective one. Uh, you could say that again, Mr. Raiden. When those sound effects start and that stuff goes on the TV, you'd swear the whole world was getting blasted. That's the general idea. I've got three guests coming this evening, rather special guests, and I wouldn't want them to be disappointed. Well, it fooled me, and I put most of the wiring in. A drink before you go, gentlemen, to a job well done? Uh, yeah, no, no thanks, uh, it's getting pretty late. Are these friends of yours? How's that? You're uh, doing all this to fool three of your friends. They must be, uh, I mean, they must be real, like, special friends. Oh, they are. They are indeed very special friends. This, in a sense, is the moment a man lives his entire life for. Yeah, 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 I, I bet. Uh, that about it, Mr. Raiden? Yes, I'd say that uh, just about does it. Ah, well, we, we gotta go. So long, Mr. Raiden. Good luck on your party. Party? Yes, you might call it the best party ever. <laughs> Bye, Mr. Raiden. <laughs> that guy gives me the heebie-jeebies. I know what you mean. This has got to be the number one kook in the whole country. I mean, can you imagine a guy spending that kind of a bundle just to set up a phony atom bomb explosion? And the whole thing set to go off at a quarter to twelve. Some kind of fanatic is he, huh? What's his angle? A practical joke, maybe, you know, like he said. Yeah, at a half a million bucks, that's some joke. Hey, hit the button, will you? Yeah, sure. You know, it's a funny thing. What? If they was to drop a bomb, I mean, if the whole world was to go up for real, it'd be kind of a pity if, uh, if the one guy left alive was somebody like him. Wow, no kidding. Well, hey, here comes the elevator. 
Live and let live. That's what I always say. Yeah, you got that right. Let's get out of here and grab some chow. Now you're talking. Going up? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hard to get used to, ain't it? This is the basement of a fashionable midtown skyscraper and office building. It's owned and occupied by one Paul Radin, whom you've just met. Mr. Radin is rich, eccentric, and single-minded. How rich, we can already surmise. How eccentric and single-minded, we shall see in a moment. Because you have just been invited to a very special party, catered and conducted exclusively for residents of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, One More Paul Bearer, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And here's the main course, dear. Baked fish, just the way you like it. Splendid. Would you care for some more milk? Not just yet, Mary. Sit down, please. Oh, who could that be? I'll get it. No, you won't. I hope it's not one of the parishioners. Wait here. But you've been on your feet all day. Dinner will keep. Nonsense. I'll see to it, dear. Oh, yes, I'll tell him at once. Who is it? The most peculiar man. What did he want? I I'm not sure, but there's a limousine waiting at the curb. He said something about a matter of life and death. Odd, isn't it? He said exactly the same thing to me. And beyond that, Colonel, you've been told nothing. Hardly a word. The driver appeared at the club, something about an old acquaintance. And you, madam? I'm as much in the dark as you are. I was busy grading papers when that very strange man in the front seat came to my door. It sounded terribly urgent. I'll have a word with him. Driver! Yes, sir. Where, may I ask, are you taking us? Be there soon, sir. Yes, but where? Who do you work for? My employer wishes to remain anonymous. Well, isn't this mysterious? Like an Agatha Christie novel. But surely you can tell us if there's a life in the balance. Here we are. Where the devil? Hmm, a very nice part of town by the looks of it. Please exit from the right of the vehicle. See here, if this is some sort of joke. I assure you, sir, it's no joke. Yet you can't even tell me who gave you your orders. It is an impressive building. You may use the private elevator. I know this building. Uh, that fountain. Elevator? To what floor? This one has only one button, and it says down. I'll enter the code for you. Well, if it doesn't go up, then it must go... The other way, of course. This is outrageous. I demand that you return me to the officer's club at once. Driver? Driver! It appears that we've been left to our own devices. It was ever thus. After you, madam. What in the... Good evening, friends. That voice. If you'd be so kind, just follow the hall to the security door at the end of the hall. There's something vaguely familiar about the tone, but I can't quite... Enough. It's time to find out what this is all about. That's right. Just come in, if you will. See here. Do sit down and make yourselves comfortable. Wait... I remember now, yes. The accommodations are a bit spartan, but I trust you'll find them adequate for your needs. How good of you to come. Colonel Hawthorne, Reverend Hughes, and of course, Mrs. Langsford. I'm delighted to see you all. What? Such blank faces? Don't tell me you've forgotten. It's Raiden, isn't it? Aren't you Paul Raiden? 
You have an excellent memory, Reverend. And how about you, Colonel? Do you recognize me? Yes, I... I believe I do. You served with me once, didn't you? I did indeed. A second lieutenant. Yes. In an infantry regiment under your command. I recall it vaguely, and I seem to recall something else, too. It's not surprising that it doesn't come flooding back. After all, you had a few thousand men under you, a few thousand cogs in the great military machine. I was only one of those cogs. But then again, you didn't court-martial all of them, did you? That distinction you reserved for me alone. Oh, yes, I do recall now. You refused to lead an assault on a hill. Did I? Refused in the face of a direct order. The delay cost us a company of men. That was your contention at the court-martial board. It's what sealed my fate. I was dishonorably discharged, Colonel. Stripped of rank and booted out. How oh, fortunate for you. Fortunate, you say? Were I permitted to dictate the sentence... I would have had you shot. <laughs> of this I have no doubt. No doubt at all. But what kind of host am I? Oh, for pity's sake, Paul. I must apologize. There's a lady present. Please forgive me for not addressing you first, Mrs. Langsford. Do you recall who I am? Of course I do. I taught you in high school. Well done. I don't forget my students. <laughs> Oh, now and then I find that they get jumbled together. Of course. But if I prod my memory a bit, I'm able to connect names with faces. And in your case, with character. I made an impression on you, did I? That's understandable. Because you flunked me, Mrs. Langsford. I certainly did. You dressed me down in front of an entire class, called me names, humiliated me. And quite deservedly so. Ah, but that's neither here nor there. I invited you here this evening for another purpose than to dredge up old animosities. Invited? I can't speak for my companions, Raiden, but the request I received was more in the form of an ultimatum. Your chauffeur said it was a matter of utmost urgency. Why, yes. Yes, indeed. That's the way it was broached to me, too. A matter of life and death. I was eating dinner, and my wife Mary got up to answer the door. And when she came back, she had such an odd expression on her face. Ah, Reverend Hughes. Still a bit on the wordy side, aren't you? It never ceases to amaze me, really, how changeless we remain over the years. But I suppose the habits of a lifetime are not that easily set aside, now are they? Perhaps you'll be good enough, Paul, to get to the point and tell us why we're here. I'd be delighted to. But first... Can't I get you something? A highball, perhaps? Or a cup of coffee for the Reverend? How do you take it, black or white? Nothing, thank you. Paul, you're trying my patience. <laughs> habits, Mrs. Langsford. The incredible persistence of habits. You call me Paul, as if I were still sitting in your classroom. What about you, a nice cup of tea? Nothing for me. And you, Colonel, a tot of rum, perhaps? I would be deeply appreciative, Mr. Raiden, if you made your point and then let us leave. You've obviously called us here for something, and I, for one, would welcome hearing whatever it is without further delay. <laughs> how staunch, how commanding you sound, Colonel. The military mind never changes either. See here. Always pressing forward. Drive, drive, drive against the objective and wipe it out. Colored flags stuck in a map and troops stuck out in the hot sun. An officer must have nerves made of steel and a head full of cement. As you were, Raiden. Oh, no, Colonel. Not as I was. As I am. Which rather upsets the chain of command, don't you think? Because I'm in command now, and what I command at this moment is your attention. You see, I've called the three of you here for a very specific purpose. I think I'm beginning to understand. Of course you are. Always so intelligent, so insightful. Let's do it in proper chronology. My dear old schoolmarm shall begin. 
that staunch and intrepid educator who would look so incongruously out of place without those severe spectacles covering those severe eyes looking out of an equally severe face, who possesses such vast prerogatives from the local school board and the vast courage that comes from pitting all her wits and training and knowledge against poor captive children. Are you quite finished, Paul? My dear lady, I haven't even begun. May I make an observation, then? You have permission to speak. Would you like to address the class? Oh, just a comment, Paul, on how incredible this whole thing is. That a man like yourself, a millionaire many times over, a big, important man who walks with kings and heads of state and industrial tycoons... You've followed my career. How gratifying. How incredibly tiny a mind this kind of man must have to dwell on an incident in a high school classroom of some twenty-odd years ago and to let it fester inside of him, as it's done with you. I've never liked... Humiliation, Mrs. Langsford, whether it occurred 20 years ago or in the past 10 minutes. Humiliation? All right, Paul, let's talk of humiliation. Let's talk of your humiliation. Mr. Raiden was caught cheating during an examination, caught red-handed. Oh, not a federal crime, of course, but perhaps just a bit commentative on the nature of the person. And when accused of the act, he tried to plant his crib sheet on an innocent student. How right you are, Mr. Raiden, that I stood you up on your feet and in front of the entire class I told you what you were. But no room then was there, Mrs. Langsford, for just a moment of compassion? An iota of sympathy for a frightened and desperate boy? Oh, Mr. Raiden, I've dealt with frightened and desperate children all my life. And it might surprise you to know that I've given them more sympathy and compassion than learning. But neither sympathy nor compassion can be handed out wholesale like cheap bubblegum. The recipient must be worthy of them, and you never were. You were a devious, dishonest troublemaker. And for all your millions, my guess is that you are still devious, you are still dishonest, and I have no doubt that even now you're a troublemaker. You haven't changed either, Mrs. Langsford. Mr. Raiden, after so many years, what can be gained by... A great deal can be gained, Reverend. A great deal. But surely... You can go to the devil, Reverend. Raiden! You too, Colonel. And that's not a figure of speech. Tonight, my friends, just a few short minutes from now, you all most assuredly can and will go to the devil. <laughs> Mr. Raiden, obviously years have passed between now and whenever it was you felt you suffered various indignities at our hands. Felt? How conveniently you forget the extent of my suffering. You, for example, accused me of lack of character, and worse, you put a scandal over my head and all but destroyed my reputation. I do remember now. A girl... A young girl whom you drove to suicide, because even at that early stage, you were not a man to hold honor in very high regard. So merciless and so judgmental. What of her responsibility, her character? You're far from consistent in your dispensation of forgiveness. No, the robes of a man of God never became you, Reverend. For all your pious pronouncements, they never quite fit. Enough of this. I'm getting out of here, now. You can try, Colonel. This is outrageous. Save your strength. You're going to need it. Open this door at once! The doors don't answer to your command, only to mine. They're made of solid steel. The walls are 18 inches of reinforced concrete sheathed in 6 inches of lead. I have my own generator plant, my own air system, and at the other end of the hall, a storeroom the size of a warehouse stocked with food and supplies. But in God's name, why? What are you afraid of? Afraid? Hardly. Prudent might be a more accurate word. Remember the story of the three little pigs, houses of straw and so forth, and only one built to withstand the blast. Blast? 
What blast? Colonel, you of all people should understand logistics. Does it occur to you why a man would go to all this trouble and expense? You've built what amounts to be a bunker. So I have. But we're not at war. Not at this precise moment. You're insane. Am I? This is the middle of the city. Ah, now you're getting warm, closer to the point. What are you talking about? About beginning a vigil, my friends. The long wait and the countdown to oblivion. Will you start making sense? I taught you better than this, this gibberish. You are correct, Mrs. Langsford, about several things. I've walked with kings and tycoons, as you so rightly perceived. I've walked with them, and more importantly, I've listened to them, to the things they have to say, the special knowledge they are able to impart because of their positions of privilege. As a result, I managed to keep abreast of the times and usually well ahead of them. The point. Patience, Reverend. I'm coming to it. You see, I know things that are going to happen. I pay informants, couriers, high-level attaches and the like for a service. Information. And I pay them quite handsomely, I might add. What sort of information? Oh, the inner workings of certain, let us say, diplomatic agencies, military installations. Information that's beyond top secret but available if the price is right. You're engaged in espionage. Hear me out. 48 hours ago, I received a most interesting bit of news, or rather, several bits meaningless in themselves that together form one unavoidable conclusion, something that is known to perhaps only six men in the world. If you're trying to frighten us, it isn't working. Then let me give it a somewhat finer edge. This evening... This very evening, the world is coming to an end. Why, of all the... At 11.45, there will be no more city, no more country. Rubbish. Oh, it was inevitable, don't you think? After so many years, so many weapons stockpiled, someone somewhere was bound to become impatient to finally push the button that brings us to the reward we so justly deserve. And make no mistake about it, we all do. It began when we were born into this cesspool called life. The original fall from grace, from which there is no escape. The earth is an empty graveyard waiting to be filled, and tonight it will be. What a cynical, depraved view of humanity. By 30 minutes after midnight, there will be no more humanity. It's too late to stop. Pandora's box has been opened. There's no turning back. They are going to bomb us, and we are going to bomb them. By dawn, there will be nothing left but rubble and bodies. And now, within a few moments, it begins. You'll be hearing the sirens very shortly. That's the red alert. It means their missiles are on the way. Ours will follow soon after with proper military efficiency. And you are to survive, Mr. Raiden. Is that the idea? I am to survive. As long as I stay here, 300 feet under the ground. Already buried, one might say. How about you, Reverend Hughes? Or the rest of you? Would you care to survive, too? Or shall I be the only pallbearer? What? It can't be. Don't panic. This whole thing may be a hoax. Please remain seated. If you require proof, I'll turn on the radio. This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has just announced a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States. Repeat, this is a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States at a high rate of speed. Arrival time is estimated at only a few minutes from now. All citizens are advised to get off the streets immediately and take cover. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. The first missiles have just hit. Are we still on the air? How long do we have? Good Lord, it's actually happening. This is real, folks. This is not a test. This is real. Comments? Perhaps a little military sophistry now, Colonel. A quote from General Grant or Lee or Patton. 
And you, Reverend, something enriching from the gospel? Oh, my, such silence, Mrs. Langford. Nothing in that vast reservoir, that pilgrim's progress mind of yours to fit this situation? No mental eraser you can use to wipe out reality? I've got to get to my wife. Oh, by all means, Reverend. Certainly, get to your wife. Hold hands and die together. Take your hands off me. You turn my stomach, Reverend Hughes. You know that. Find your wife. I intend to. That's not what's on your mind. What's on your mind is what's on the colonel's mind and the school marms over there. Your precious hide. Your sanctified flesh. That's what preoccupies you at this moment. Let go of me, Mr. Raiden. If I'm to die tonight, I want to be with someone I love. <laughs> Very theatrical, Reverend Hughes. But far more burlesque, I'm afraid, than legitimate theater. Kindly have the decency. Why don't you have the decency, Reverend, to depart this earth with just a fragment of the truth in your mouth? What truth? Tell me to my face that you are so scared, so miserably frightened, that you'd sell your wife by the pound if it meant your survival. Admit it. If those were the last words I ever spoke, Mr. Raiden, they would also stand as the worst falsehood I ever uttered while living. Why am I not convinced? Will you open the door, Mr. Raiden? Will you let me leave now? Take a look at the monitor first. You might want to consider what awaits you outside before you open that door. How did you know, Raiden? How could you possibly have known exactly when? What difference does it make? If we leave now, we might make it back to our homes. Highly unlikely at this point, but I suppose hope springs eternal. Oh, of course, Mrs. Langsford, back home to your aging sister, no doubt. And you, Colonel, back to the club so you can die with your cronies amid all your medals and memorabilia. Whatever we do, it's none of your concern. My dear friends, shall we drop the pretense now, this instant? Shall we all of us now dare to speak the truth? I told you how this room was constructed, steel, concrete, and lead. It is the only place where you can survive. Now, what is all this nonsense about going back to your homes? You mean to say you'd walk out of here to certain death, when by simply staying where you are, you're assured that you'll live? Are we to understand, Mr. Raiden, that you will permit us this luxury? That you will allow us to stay in your fortress? Oh, indeed. Indeed, Colonel. As a matter of fact, it's precisely why I asked you all to come. Each of you, in your own way, tried to destroy me. But I will not repay the compliment in like kind. That is to say, I won't require an eye for an eye. Nothing quite as basic, as naked as that. Then I'd be interested, Mr. Raiden. What is your price? <laughs> the Colonel would be interested. I should think so. And I presume the school marm and the reverend, too, would be interested. I submit, dear friends, that you're not just interested. It's the only single thing on God's earth that has any meaning left. How much will Raiden charge so you can stay here in safety? All right, my friends, here's the all-important price tag. The fiddler has played, and here comes the bill for the music. But be sure to listen carefully, because time is very rapidly running out. Say it, man. What is your price? You will, each of you, each one of you in turn, beg my pardon, ask my forgiveness... And if need be, you'll get down on your hands and knees to perform that function. Is that all? That's all. Our Father who art in heaven... I suggest you prepare your requests without delay. The first bombs have just exploded somewhere near the city. I assure you, the next ones won't miss. Did you hear what I said? I need your decisions now. Say pretty please. I beg your pardon. Pretty please with sugar on it. How's that, teacher? Speak up! Pretty please with sugar on it, Mr. Raiden. 
It's what children say to exact a favor. Children, Mr. Raiden, but they say it by rote. It comes out pure. There's no meanness to it, no cruelty. That's something that comes much later in life. The capacity to damage other human beings. That's enough. Not quite. You let me out of here, Mr. Raiden. If I'm to spend my last quarter hour on Earth, I'd rather it be with a stray cat, or alone in Central Park, or with a city full of strangers whose names I'll never know. Have you lost your mind? The door, Mr. Raiden. Will you open the door now? You heard them. Heard what? Stubbornness for its own sake? Sheer contrariness? Absolute irrationality in the face of a... That? Open up, Raiden. Yes, open it. You're too blind, or you're too stupid. That must be it, because none of you understand how simple it is. All you have to do, literally all you have to do, is to say a sentence. Just a string of silly, mindless words, like a command, Colonel, like a prayer, Reverend, like a lesson. Nothing more than that. All you have to say is that you're sorry. I have nothing to be sorry for. You deserve that, Court Martial, and more. I'll hardly withdraw my complaint now. And I, Mr. Raiden, pity you that you still can't see the error of your ways. May God have mercy on your soul. All right, all right. You want to go out there and die? Go, but you'll all be back inside of five minutes. There's the elevator, go, go, go ahead, use it. Carry the farce to its conclusion. Stand aside. Where are you going? Up there? To what? As far away from here as I can get. Do you hear that? Are you deaf? You still want to go up on the street? Why? To get a good look at the frenzy and the panic and the horror? Before you come back down here to your only salvation? Move away from the elevator. But you don't need to see it firsthand. Watch it from here on the monitor. You can see it happen, the whole thing. Watch as your world is shoveled into a grave and covered over. Move, or I shall be forced to move you. You fool. After you, ma'am. Last chance. I mean it. It's your last chance. What about it, Hughes? Is life so stinking cheap you can throw it down a drain? No, no, it, it's not true. This is, this is no fantasy. You'll be back. You'll see. You'll be back. This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has issued a red alert. The United States is under enemy attack. The first wave of bombers and long-range missiles slipped through our defenses by unknown means and are on the approach now. Evacuation procedures are underway in all major cities. The president will make an announcement as soon as, as soon as, this is real, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a drill. This is not a test. This is an actual emergency. What? That's not what he's supposed to say. We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to bring you this live coverage. Just before midnight this evening, several of the country's major population centers suffered missile attacks resulting in severe casualties. Seed mentality. Unconfirmed report of nuclear detonations. The White House, the Midwest, the coast. We will remain on the air for as long as... What's wrong with this? Off! I want this tape off! That's enough. That is quite enough! Ladies and gentlemen, this is my last assignment as a broadcaster. I can see the bombs going off. And now, now they're streaking down, lighting up the sky, heading directly for us. A great wind from the firestorm. If you can hear me, I want my wife and daughter to know that, that I love them very much. No! 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 No, 
Oh, please. I didn't mean for it to actually happen. Th there's, there's nothing, nothing left. Nothing. The city is gone. Is there, is there no one else alive? Somebody? Anybody? <laughs> What's wrong with him? He must be drunk. Poor man, he looks crazy. Yeah, look at his eyes. What's he crying? <laughs> All right, Mac, get up. Hey, Mac, what's the matter with you? Got a little too much to drink, huh? On a beautiful night like this. Well, oh, now let me take you home. Where do you live? Can you tell me that? I didn't. I didn't want it this way. Won't somebody listen to me? Isn't there anyone left in the world who can hear me? Someone! Someone! Uh, this is Saunders. I'm in front of the Raiden building. You want to send a car over here right away? Some poor devil's lying on the ground off his rocker. No ID. Yeah, it could be anybody. Yeah, okay. It's okay, Mac. Help's on the way. Now, why don't you come on over here and sit down by the fountain? That's right, in front of this nice building. You weren't going to no, try taking a bath no, in it, were you? No. Because then I'd have to arrest you, and I wouldn't want to do that. Can you hear me? Can't you even tell me where you live? You know where you are? Anything around here look familiar at all? What happened to him? Another nutcase. Never saw him. Is he deaf or blind? Okay, folks, let's move along. Move right along. Give the poor fella some breathing space till the ambulance gets here. <laughs> easy, Mac. Take it easy. You're gonna be okay. No, no. No, no, no. No. No, somebody. Somebody. Some, any, anybody. Anybody. Is anybody left alive in all this rubble? Not another human being anywhere in all the world. Please, please, please. Oh, please, God, oh, please. <laughs> Mr. Paul Raiden, a dealer in fantasy and human misery, especially his own. Trapped in the graveyard of his mind, and now, as it has always been for him, the only person in the world. The sole pallbearer at a funeral he alone manufactured in a bleak and empty landscape called the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. One More Paul Bearer, starring Chelsea Ross with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Meg Falcon, Rich Kamenick, Turk Muller, Norm Waddell, Jeff Lupiton, Roderick Peoples, and Lawrence Nepadal. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Hey.